Hi, I'm Eric Cressy. And I'm Mike Robertson. Welcome to Magnificent Mobility, 10 minutes to improve flexibility, performance, and health. Admit it, when it comes to warming up, you do what you've always done. You jog a little and then stretch before you lift because your fourth grade phys ed teacher told you that was the best way to do things. Forget science, you listen because you were supposed to and because he had a whistle, not because he was actually right. Well, we're here to rock the boat. Your PE teacher wasn't entirely wrong, but there's definitely a much better way to prepare for training and competition. Just as we wish that every athlete and client with whom we've ever worked would simply accept this assertion as fact, we wish you would too. Unfortunately, just as they stubbornly argued against the notion that pre-training static stretching has negative consequences, we expect you to do the same. So, with that said, we'd like to take a few moments to outline our rationale for the programming we'll present to you in this video. You're probably wondering what's so wrong with going through a comprehensive static stretching regime prior to exercise. In a broad sense, the main reason is that there is considerable scientific evidence demonstrating that static stretching of a muscle decreases its isometric and dynamic muscle strength at different velocities. Isometric strength has significant implications in terms of one's stability during complex movements, and dynamic strength is obviously of great importance when it comes to actual movement. So, in plain English, this means that you'll be slower and weaker on tasks that are fundamental to high level performance. We're not just talking applications to a very distinct class of athletes here either. It really can affect everyone. Static stretching acutely impairs both slow speed, high force movements such as powerlifting, and high speed, lower force movements such as jumping and sprinting. There's also research showing that balance, reaction time, and overall movement time are negatively affected. And the endurance athletes out there will be interested to know that static stretching reduces muscular endurance as well. For those who care for the scientific rationale for these reductions in performance, it's speculated that the problems result from one or both of two factors. First, it may be an issue with the muscles themselves. Prolonged stretching can actually make the muscle and tendon overly compliant. Whenever we want to develop force in a muscle, it's important that we have plenty of stiffness as this allows for better use of stored elastic energy in the muscle and tendon and ensures that everything lines up properly at the level of the muscle fibers. The second theory involves nervous system factors related to motor control and reflex sensitivity. Basically, the stretching makes it harder for the nervous system to tell the muscles to fire. Now, we'll stop there before we turn into science geeks and lose most of you. Let's leave it at this. If you're a healthy athlete looking to improve performance, with a few exceptions we'll note later, pre-training static stretching is not a good idea. It's often said that one shouldn't criticize the status quo unless one has a recommendation to approve upon it. So you can bet that we aren't going to leave you hanging. The le logical next question is, what are we looking for in a good warm-up session, and why aren't light jogging and static stretching sufficient to meet these needs? In the science of sports training, Thomas Kerr's outlined the following goals for the warm-up period. Improved elasticity and contractibility of muscles greater efficiency of the respiratory and cardiovascular systems, shorter reaction time, improved perception, better concentration, improved coordination, and regulation of emotional states. As we mentioned earlier, static stretching reduces elasticity and contractibility of the muscles and impairs reaction time, balance, and coordination. It won't have much effect on the respiratory and cardiovascular systems and may even relax you to the point of impairing concentration and mellowing you out when you need to be fired up. Nonetheless, people insist that two to three minutes on the stationary cycle and some static stretching can't be beat when it comes to training preparation. What these individuals fail to realize is that increasing body temperature alone will meet most of the aforementioned goals of the warm-up, so they stick with what they've always done. Unfortunately, improvement and optimization are not one and the same. There's a much more convenient, efficient, fun, and effective way to get the job done, dynamic flexibility. Before we go any further, we need to briefly outline the difference between dynamic stretching and ballistic stretching. Fletcher and Jones define dynamic stretching as controlled movement through the active range of motion for each joint. Conversely, ballistic stretching refers to repeated mini bounces at the end of a joint's range of motion. This is a riskier approach associated with muscle damage and shortening. Dynamic flexibility drills serve as a fantastic way to transition from rest to high intensity exercise that is performed through full ranges of motion. Research has shown that dynamic stretching improves performance in sprints, jumping tasks, and agility tests, increases dynamic range of motion, reduces injury rates when compared with a static stretching program. Dynamic flexibility is rapidly increasing in popularity, but as with any exercise trend, just because people are doing it doesn't necessarily mean they're doing it correctly. We're not just getting blood flowing, 
we're grooming the motor patterns that will directly impact the training session that follows. So, we're looking for proper posture and smooth movement execution. Otherwise, you'll just be teaching your body to move in an inefficient and potentially dangerous manner. Now, nobody wants to spend all day warming up, so it's crucial that you select the drills that will give you the most bang for your buck. Otherwise, you'll overdo it and wind up tiring yourself out before you actually get to your chosen activity. All athletes have unique needs based on sports demands and individual weaknesses. However, the drills we're going to outline are the ones that have proven most valuable with the athletes and clients with whom we've worked. Rather than give you a set program, we'll present what each drill will do for you so you can compile your own regimen that's suited to your own needs. We've grouped these drills into three categories, easy, medium, and difficult. All sessions should begin with easy drills and progress in difficulty. For most, eight to 10 of the drills in a single session will be sufficient, but definitely give each a shot at some point in time. You'll note that although we devote some of our efforts to the upper body, we spend a lot more time working in the lower body, especially the hips. As a joint designed for maximum stability, the hip is often deprived of important mobility, especially in a society that has a seated at computers more and more. Conversely, the shoulder is a more mobile joint that benefits from extra stability training in most individuals, so the movements we devote to this, the upper body will address this need. Above all, as is the case with the real world of athletics, you'll find that true isolation in any of these movements does not occur. We're looking for you to teach your body to move as an efficient, cohesive unit. And we should mention that poor mobility is something that most of the injured athletes and clients we see have in common. Don't be surprised at how many of your old aches and pains start to disappear once you teach your body to move efficiently and your mobility improves. You'll be amazed at how closely related health and performance really are. As we demonstrate each movement, you'll notice a human body diagram with areas designated either red or blue. Areas marked with red are those areas we're looking to activate. They're the muscles that are most commonly shut down in the face of dysfunction. The glutes and scapular retractors are good examples. The blue regions denote musculature that needs to be lengthened to allow for efficient movement. The hip flexors and adductors are two examples of this category. The cat camel is our first spinal flossing movement. Like all spinal flossing movements, not only does the cat camel teach proper movement around the lumbopelvic region, but it also improves nerve spacing and loosens up the muscles around the lower back and hips. We would like to say these three movements dissociate the hips from the lower back, allowing each to move freely and independently of the other. To begin, have the athlete start off on all fours with the hands underneath the shoulders and the knees underneath the hips. The cat movement is very simple for most. Lift the head and chest simultaneously while letting the stomach sink. In this position, you'll have a nice arch in your lower back. To perform the camel, you're going to do the exact opposite. Try it around the back from top to bottom, letting the head and neck drop and trying to get the head and buttocks as close together as possible. This movement is not a stretch, so don't force the end range of motion. Instead, think of gently moving back and forth between the two movements. The most common issues you'll see with this movement are bending of the elbows to achieve the range of motion and or lateral shifting of the body. The arms should be kept straight throughout and the only movement should be around the back. The yoga twist is our second spinal flossing movement and one that really emphasizes side-to-side -side mobility around the hips. Lay on your back with your legs straight and arms straight out to the side, then take one ankle and cross it over the other. From the starting position, twist from the hips in a side-to-side -side fashion. Just like the cat camel, don't focus on forcing the range of motion, but rather on fluid movement from side to side. After performing the necessary repetitions, switch the ankles so that the opposite leg is on top and repeat. The yoga twist is a fairly simple movement, so the only errors you'll probably encounter are people who struggle with initiating the movement at the hips or people who force the end range of motion. The side twist is the third and final installment of our spinal flossing movements. This movement is a little more awkward than the first two, 
but again helps to dissociate the hips from the lumbar spine. Begin by laying on your side with your head propped up by your hand, your torso and legs in line with each other, and the knees bent at a 90 degree angle. Your free hand should be placed on the floor in front of you to keep your torso from rotating too much. From here, you'll again think of initiating the movement from the hips and flipping the feet over. Just like the other spinal flossing movements, do not force the end range of motion, but rather gently move within a comfortable range. Perform the allotted number of repetitions, then switch sides. The biggest errors you'll see with a side twist are trouble starting the movement around the hips and excessive rotation of the torso if the free hand isn't placed in front. The bent knee twist is similar to the spinal flossing movements, but it doesn't allow for the same type of flossing of the nerves that you get from those movements. Regardless, it's still a great movement to loosen up the lower back. Begin by laying flat on your back with the knees bent and the feet flat on the floor. With the feet and knees together, allow the knees to fall from side to side, getting a stretch in the lower back and upper hips. Like the spinal flossing movements, don't force the range of motion and gently work through a comfortable range of motion. The only error we typically see are athletes who do not keep their shoulders down. Popularized by Stuart McGill as a premier lower back rehabilitation movement, the bird dog is an excellent exercise for improving strength and motor control in the gluteals, but also for developing the stabilizing muscles in the back. This exercise is a great option for everyone from the aspiring athlete to the rehabilitating weekend warrior. Start in an all fours position with the knees underneath the hips and the hands underneath the shoulders. From the starting position, brace the stomach as if you were about to be punched. From here, squeeze one glute and press the heel back until the leg is straight. Simultaneously, reach forward completely with the opposite arm and then return to the starting position. Repeat as necessary, then perform the opposite side. While this exercise may seem very easy at first glance, it can be quite difficult when performed correctly. Make sure not to let the torso tip to one side and focus on pushing the leg straight back rather than allowing it to kick laterally. This lateral kicking would indicate an overactive tensor fascia lata and the iliotibial band attempting to take over the movement. The side-lying trunk twist is great because each of us typically has side-to-side -side discrepancies in the rotary muscles around our back. This stretch can also be used in a static fashion post-workout to loosen up the same muscles and iron out side-to-side -side imbalances. Lay on your left side with your arms outstretched and the left leg straight. Take the right leg and flex it at the hip and knee until you make a 90 degree angle, resting it on the ground. This is the starting position. From the starting position, Take the right arm and reach back across the body until you get a stretch in the middle and lower back. Return to the starting position and repeat for the necessary number of repetitions. Make sure that the hip and knee are at 90 degree angles prior to initiating the movement and do not allow the down knee to come off the ground. With all the running and jumping that athletes do, it's no wonder we see so many injuries involving the lower leg and Achilles tendon. This is an excellent movement to warm up this often injured area. Lay down in a push-up position and press your body up into a pike position where the hips are higher than the rest of your body. Take your left foot and place it behind your right ankle. From the starting position, keep the leg straight and press the heel of the right foot down to the ground until you get a stretch in the calves. Repeat for the necessary repetitions, then switch sides. 
This exercise can also be performed with a knee bent to put more emphasis on the soleus muscle rather than the gastrocnemius. Fire hydrants are an excellent movement for integrating hip abduction and extension, two primary functions of the gluteal complex. From a starting position on your hands and knees, abduct the thigh on one side to lift it off the ground. As you reach the end of your abduction range of motion, extend the leg back completely and then return the leg to the starting position. When performed fluently, this movement will seem almost circular. Many individuals try to rush this movement and wind up missing out on full extension of the thigh. Make sure that you're getting enough abduction at the start as well. Before we discuss the bridge, we need to discuss why we need to bridge. Two laws are applicable here, the law of synergistic dominance and the law of reciprocal inhibition. When the hip flexors are excessively tight, which they often are, their tension lengthens and inhibits the antagonistic gluteals from contracting. The law of synergistic dominance states that when surrounding muscles are excessively tight, like the spinal erectors and hamstrings, the gluteals again will not be able to produce the same kind of force of which they're normally capable. When you consider that the gluteals are the strongest hip extensor in the body, you want them doing all the work they possibly can. For the supine bridge, start with your head, back, and butt flat on the floor and legs at 90 degrees. Squeeze your cheeks and go up just as high as your cheeks will take you. Don't use your low back and hamstrings. If it helps, Think about trying to raise the back up one vertebrae at a time off the floor. On the negative, lower under control to a point just above the floor without touching and then repeat as necessary. If you're having trouble keeping your hamstrings out of the movement, lightly touch your quads so that they activate a bit. That way, you won't be able to activate your hamstrings because they'll be reciprocally inhibited. Common errors we see are going too far in the range of motion, using lumbar hyperextension to complete the movement, and not actively contracting the glutes to posteriorly tilt the pelvis at lockout. Remember, this exercise is all about getting the right muscles to work, not improving range of motion or performing a certain number of repetitions. Do it right. This movement is very similar to the previous one, except you'll be doing it on one leg and it's more challenging. Start with your head, back, and butt flat on the floor and legs at 90 degrees. Next, grab one leg and hug it to your chest. Squeeze the cheek of your down leg and go up just as high as your glute will take you. Don't use your low back and hamstrings. If it helps, think about trying to raise the back up one vertebrae at a time off the floor. On the negative, lower under control to a point just above the floor without touching and then repeat as necessary. If you have trouble keeping your hamstrings out of the movement, have someone lightly touch your quad so that they activate a bit. That way you won't be able to activate your hamstrings because they'll be reciprocally inhibited. Just like the double leg bridge, make sure not to go any higher than your glutes will take you. You also really want to squeeze the glutes hard at the top of the movement and your head should not come off the floor throughout the course of the movement. Anterior posterior leg swing has been a staple in warm up routines for decades. Initially, you'll want to hold on to something as you do this exercise. 
Once you get the hang of it, you can do it freestanding. From a standing position, you're just going to flex and extend the thigh rhythmically as if you were a punter kicking a football. Make sure the motion occurs predominantly at the hips and not the lumbar spine. Many individuals will try to hyperextend at the lower back to compensate for a lack of range of motion and hip extension. Keep the chest out and shoulders back with the eyes looking straight ahead. When performing this version of the leg swing, it's important to make sure that the hips are where the swinging is occurring. Many individuals have tight hip flexors and will therefore have insufficient hip extension range of motion. As a result, their natural tendency will be to hyperextend at the lumbar spine. It's best to limit how far they can go rather than allow them to go too far in a faulty movement pattern. Be sure to avoid rounding of the upper back and shoulders as well. Keep the knees almost completely locked. If you bend them excessively, the hamstrings will never lengthen sufficiently to make this a productive drill. The side to side leg swing is very similar to our previous exercise, but targets the adductors and abductors of the thigh. Initially, you'll want to hold on to something as you do this exercise. Once you get the hang of it, you can do it freestanding. From a standing position, you're just going to abduct and adduct the thigh rhythmically as a ballerina would as a warm up. Make sure the motion occurs predominantly at the hips and not through side to side hip movement. Keep the chest out and shoulders back with the eyes looking straight ahead throughout. Most individuals are tight in their hip adductors, so watch out for lateral tilting of the torso to compensate for a lack of hip abduction range of motion. Be sure to avoid rounding of the shoulders and or upper back as well. The supine scorpion is an excellent warm-up movement because so many people these days are incredibly tight in their lateral and posterior thighs. This movement loosens up these typically tight areas and promotes optimal movement. Lay on your back with the arms outstretched to the side and the legs straight. Keeping the legs straight throughout, take one leg up and across the body and touch the toes on the ground on the opposite side. As the athlete gets more flexible, encourage him or her to try and get the toes closer and closer to the opposite hand. Do not let the shoulders come up too far. This typically happens when the athlete tries to get the foot too close to the hand when he or she does not have adequate flexibility to do so. prone scorpion is a little different from its supine counterpart, specifically because it's more of an activation exercise than a true stretch. Lie face down on the ground with the legs straight and together while the arms are extended to the side. Initiate the movement by squeezing the glute and swinging one leg back and over the opposite leg and your torso. Touch the toe to the ground and then return to the starting position. Really focus on keeping the shoulders down while performing this exercise. Remember that our primary goal here is to get our glute muscles firing better, not seeing how far we can wrench our spine to increase the range of motion. Nonetheless, once your dynamic flexibility comes around, you may very well be able to touch your foot to the opposite hand. This exercise emphasizes the smaller gluteus medius and minimus muscles rather than the larger gluteus maximus. Stand on one leg and drop the opposite hip out and let the hip on the side that's balancing poke out. Hold for a second and then correct 
back to the starting position. One thing you want to make sure to do is keep your torso as level as possible. If your torso is all over the place, you're probably using your quadratus lumborum instead of your gluteus medius and minimus. This is definitely not a good practice as most people have overactive QLs already. Finally, don't rotate the body while performing this exercise. The movement should be purely side to side. The feedback afforded by a mirror can be very helpful as you work to get the proper feeling of the movement. The most common errors we see with this movement are rotating as one drops and not keeping the torso level. Remember, this is a subtle movement. If you're moving all over the place, you're probably performing it incorrectly. Rotation is a crucial component of most athletic movements, yet classical warm-up programs generally fail to have athletes preparing in the transverse plane. Windmills address this common flaw in those non-functional warm-ups. Set up with a wide stance and your torso upright. Rotate and flex at the hips, reaching with your right arm to your left foot. Rhythmically transition with rotation to the right side with your left arm. Keeping the chest and eyes up, all the bending over should be achieved with hip flexion not lumbar flexion. Many individuals will stoop over and round at the upper and or lower back to get to the down position. Instead, think of pushing the hips back to get into the start position. Keep your eyes up throughout the movement. If you look down, the posture at the upper and lower back is bound to fall apart. Now that we've covered all our stationary movements, let's get into some drills that will have you moving around. These exercises are great because not only will you improve your mobility, but you'll also be improving your balance and coordination as well. The first exercise on our list is the high knee walk. From the starting position, take a step forward and raise one knee. Grasp the knee with both hands and hug it, pulling it up and into your chest. As you are pulling the leg up and in, raise up on the opposite toe. Return to the starting position, then repeat with the opposite leg. When performing this exercise, make sure you are actively pulling the knee up and in. Also, focus on maintaining good posture and not getting too much forward lean. pullback butt kick is the opposite of our previous movement, the high knee walk. This exercise works to lengthen the quadriceps and hip flexor muscles. From the starting position, take a step forward and curl one leg up towards your buttocks. Grasp the foot with the same side hand and pull it into your buttock. As you are pulling the leg in, lift up on the opposite toe. Return to the starting position and repeat with the opposite leg. Those who are really tight will try to lean forward excessively and or abduct the leg to compensate for lack of hip extension range of motion. Be sure to stay completely upright and don't allow the leg to move too far laterally. It should kick straight backward and or very close to it. band sidestep is a simple yet effective exercise for improving motor control and strength of the glute medius and minimus muscles. They may be small muscles, but they are largely responsible for stability in the hips and knees. Wrap a mini band around your legs just above the kneecaps or at the ankles. Keeping the toes pointed forward, walk sideways with only a slight bend in the knees. 
Avoid dragging the back foot and make sure the band remains taut throughout the duration of the movement. If it helps, you can actually put your hand on the same side hip to facilitate contraction of the gluteus medius and minimus. After performing the necessary repetitions, go back facing the same direction but leading with the opposite leg. Don't allow any slack in the band and be sure not to let the trailing foot drag. Hip mobility is a common buzzword nowadays in the fitness and performance enhancement industries. If you don't know what hip mobility is, you're about to find out. Take a step forward and then think about pulling the instep of your foot up to your groin. Use your hands to grab your foot and ankle to pull up and further facilitate the stretch. This exercise is tougher than it sounds. Be sure to be cognizant of proper posture as you go. Watch out for rounding of the shoulders and or upper back and make sure that you're actively pulling the foot up instead of just grasping it. This exercise is also known as a push-up plus. Basically, it's a push-up without any movement at the shoulder or elbow joints. Set up as if you were going to do a push-up and then just allow your shoulder blades to retract without bending your elbows. You should drop about two inches towards the floor. To reverse the motion, protract the scapula until you're back in the starting position. This exercise activates and strengthens the serratus anterior a muscle that is crucial in holding the scapula tight to the rib cage, thus preventing scapular winging. This muscle is generally the first to shut down whenever shoulder dysfunction is present. The two most common problems we see are bending of the elbows and allowing the hips to sag. If you don't have the strength to perform this movement in a regular push-up position, you can do it from your knees or standing with your hands on a wall. This movement is very simple and has been used by Olympic lifters for decades to develop mobility around the shoulders. Grab a broomstick or PVC pipe with an extra wide grip. Starting with the bar in front of your hips, slowly raise the bar in an arc to a point where you get a good stretch in the front of your shoulders, pecs, and lats. Bring it all the way around so that it's behind you at the level of your glutes. As you warm up, bring your grip in a little bit closer and continue to push the limits of your flexibility. Make sure that you don't bend your elbows or excessively arch the lower back. Stand tall and keep the arms straight throughout. For those of you who enjoy track and field, you've probably seen your favorite sprinter do this next exercise in some form or fashion. It's an excellent exercise for lengthening the hamstrings and getting them ready for a great training session. For those of you who want and need more dynamic hip extensor stretching, this is the exercise for you. We include it in the difficult category because it does tend to blur the line a bit between dynamic and ballistic stretching. As long as you aren't performing it first in your warm-up, you should be fine with it. Lift one arm out in front of you and actively kick your opposite foot up towards your hand. Remember, perfect posture here is crucial. Keep the chest up and tall throughout. You can do this in a walking or skipping fashion. This one will be challenging for those of you with tight hamstrings, so be sure to avoid rounding of the shoulders and or upper back and considerable bending of the knee to make up for the lack of hip flexion range of motion. 
The legs should be straight and you should be upright throughout the movement. This movement is very similar to the strength exercise by the same name, but with a greater emphasis on single leg stability. Begin by taking a step forward and placing the weight on the heel. Keep a slight bend in the knee of the support leg. Keeping excellent posture, chest high, scapula retracted, slightly arched lower back, push your butt back to enable you to lower the torso down like you are performing a toe touch. Simultaneously, swing the opposite leg back as far as you can. You should try to touch the fingertips to the ground. Return to the starting position and repeat with the opposite leg. The backward version is the same exercise, just moving in the opposite direction. The same problems you'll see with a classic deadlift will emerge with this movement, so it is often very challenging to learn. Watch out for rounding of the upper and lower back and make sure to avoid looking down as well. The eyes should be focused forward and slightly up. Go as deep as your flexibility allows and don't rush through reps. Staying completely upright in between each step. Reverse warrior lunge with twist is a little tricky as we are going to make you move backwards. The majority of the population has very tight hip flexors, so this stretch is one from which most of you will get tremendous benefit. Begin by dropping into a reverse lunge with the back knee just above the ground. From the lunge position, twist and reach back over the front leg. Finish up by driving off the front heel back to the starting position. For added variety, you can do these walking forward. The two most common problems we see are not getting deep enough and not taking long enough strides. Avoid these two pitfalls and keep your chest upright throughout the movement and you'll be golden. The walking Spider-Man isn't put into the difficult category without reason. Not only are these areas tight, but keeping proper posture throughout the movement can be very tough as well. To begin, stride out into an exaggerated forward lunge position. While in the lunge position, take the elbow on the same side as the forward leg and try to get it as close to the heel as possible. Now, stand up completely in between repetitions and repeat on the opposite side. Be careful to avoid rounding of the lower back. Given the nature of the movement, some subtle upper back rounding is okay, but don't let it get out of hand. Depth is important if you really want to get the adductors, so be sure to take long strides. The adductors are an often maligned muscle group. So-called groin pulls are not only painful, but can be debilitating injuries. This stretch will work to loosen up the entire hip region, especially the adductors, and keep you injury free. Step directly to the side and sink into a lateral side lunge. The weight should be on the heel and the chest up. The key here is to improve hip mobility in the bent leg while improving flexibility in the adductors on the straight leg. Focus on keeping the toes pointed straight forward throughout. Get deep on these and once you come up, rotate around and lead with the opposite leg. Don't round the shoulders or upper back. The chest should be up and out. Keep the heels on the floor as you sink into the squat. If you feel like they're coming up, limit your depth until your flexibility improves. It's acceptable to have your toes pointed slightly outward during this drill. 
It'll help those of you with tight hip flexors and calves to perform the movement correctly. The squat is arguably the greatest strength training exercise of all time. Unfortunately, most people don't have the flexibility to do it correctly. This movement is going to loosen up all those squatting muscles and give you the flexibility and mobility to squat deep. With a slightly wider than shoulder width stance, bend over and grab the bottom of your shoes. From here, pull yourself into a deep squat position. Key points to remember are chest up, knees out, and slight arch in the lower back. The goal is to get a little lower with better posture each repetition. Hold for a second or two in the hole before standing up and repeating. All the things that are important in a regular squat are important here. Most importantly, you want to keep ideal posture with the chest up and the back flat. Also, some are very tight around the ankles, so try not to let your heels rise up in the bottom position. The crossover overhead reverse lunge is a great exercise for loosening up the anterior and lateral hip musculature. Start with your feet shoulder width apart and your arms at your sides. Initiate the movement by striding backward and behind you with one leg as if you were taking a stage bow. With left leg support, your right leg should be reaching to seven o'clock. With right leg support, your left leg should be reaching to five o'clock. Keep the front shin perpendicular to the floor. As you stride back, reach overhead. Push off the heel of the front foot to return to the starting position and repeat the movement on the opposite side. Make sure the torso remains upright the entire time. Make sure you don't stride too far laterally. If you do, you'll tip over. Posture is especially important here as well. Don't let the shoulders and upper back round. Anyone who had an old school PE or sports coach has probably done this exercise. We're going to run forward and kick our heels to our butt. This is one of those simple yet effective exercises as it works to dynamically lengthen the quadriceps and take stress off the knees. In fact, even though they didn't know it, those old school coaches were actually using reciprocal inhibition to improve the stretch in the quadriceps. The same errors from the pullback butt kicks are commonly observed here. Make sure that you aren't leaning forward or allowing the leg to move to the side instead of just backward. High knee skips are a progression from the high knee walks we performed earlier, but we're picking up the speed considerably and adding some arm action to give you a little more bang for your buck. Everyone should know how to skip from the time they're in grade school. Just exaggerate the movement in this case by really getting the knees up and emphasizing arm action. It's tough to skip incorrectly if you know how to do it, but specific to this movement, just make sure that you're getting the knees high enough and using your arms. The most common mistake we see with this movement is that athletes just get lazy and don't complete each rep properly.
the deep wide out drop is a great progression into squatting or any movement that requires significant deceleration. From a standing position with your feet shoulder width apart, quickly but smoothly drop into a wider stance deep squat. Your feet should momentarily leave the ground before landing on the midfoot and sitting back into a deep squat. Keep your arms extended in front of you to assist in keeping the chest out and shoulders up. Focus on using the posterior chain to help the quadriceps cushion the drop. Pop back up to the shoulder width starting position by again momentarily leaving the ground. Keep the heels down on all your landings. Some individuals' heels will come up off the ground in the deepest portion of the squat. This can be avoided by limiting squat depth until flexibility improves or by externally rotating the feet slightly. Rounding of the upper and or lower back can be a problem in those with poor flexibility at the hips and ankles, so be sure to keep the chest out and eyes up. Finally, don't execute this as a high velocity reactive training method. It's meant to be smooth and rhythmic, so try to land softly. The supine leg whip is an excellent exercise for enhancing hip mobility while improving gluteal activation and lumbopelvic control. Lay on your back and push your hips up in the air by activating your glutes. Raise one leg to a point where it is extended and perpendicular to the ground while holding yourself in the up position with the support leg. Lower the elevated leg directly to the side without letting the hips turn too far. As you reach the end range of motion, whip the leg back to the starting position by activating your adductors. Repeat for repetitions. The glute should never touch the ground during performance of the exercise. This movement takes a bit of endurance, so be sure to avoid letting the hips drop as you lower the opposite leg. Excessive rotation at the lumbar and thoracic spine may also be a problem. Remember that this movement is supposed to occur almost exclusively at the junction of the hips. As you recall, we noted earlier that there are a few static stretches that we do recommend for the warm-up period. There are only three, and holding each for 15 seconds on each side should suffice. First, we have the warrior lunge hip flexor stretch. Mike is going to assume a lunge position with his front shin vertical and reach overhead. Notice that the torso remains upright and he doesn't hyperextend at the lumbar spine. The stretch is felt on the front of the trailing leg's hip, and you can increase the stretch a bit by rotating toward the front leg. Second, we have the prone IT band and tensor fascia lata stretch. Mike begins as if he was going to do a push-up, but instead bends one knee and brings his instep underneath him toward the opposite hip. The hips remain level and the knee is at the midline of the body. He then lowers himself to use his body weight to increase the stretch, which you'll feel on the lateral aspect of his thigh on the lead leg. Notice that his back remains flat throughout the duration of the stretch. Third, we have a double neck stretch. Mike is going to put his right hand behind his back as if he was being handcuffed and then use his left hand to gently pull his head to the left. This will stretch out the lateral neck musculature on the right side. After a 15 second hold, he'll tuck his chin, look down towards his left foot and gently pull the head in that direction with the left arm. This will stretch out the right side's posterior neck musculature. The secret with both of these stretches is to keep the shoulder blade pulled down. Well. That wraps up the video, so now the ball is in your court. Starting today, make sure to integrate some or even all of these movements into your training programs. We strongly encourage you to make time for dynamic flexibility drills instead of finding time. You don't just have to use them pre-training and pre-competition. You can also do them on non-training days to assist in recovery and groove proper movement patterns. Not only will you be rewarded with a body that moves more efficiently, but you'll suffer fewer injuries and perhaps even fix some existing injuries you've been suffering from. Best of luck with your training.